Welcome to the Private School Leader Podcast, where private school leaders learn how to thrive and not just survive at one of the most difficult jobs on earth. I'm your host, Mark Vincus. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever gotten to the end of a day at school and felt discouraged and overwhelmed? Have you ever had a day when you worked really hard, but at the end of the day, it just felt like you hadn't accomplished anything? After you walk in the front doors of your school, does the tyranny of the urgent keep you from working on the parts of your job that are actually the most important parts? And when your board president or head of school starts to talk about work-life balance, do you think to yourself that sounds nice, but it also sounds impossible. Well, if you answered yes to any of these questions, I have good news and bad news for you. I'll give you the bad news first. If you keep doing this, you are going to put yourself in the hospital with physical problems or mental health problems or both. And I know because I've been there. I've been at the lowest of all low points. I've been in the hospital with ulcers. I've had lousy relationships with my family because they never saw me. I've worked really, really hard and felt discouraged and overwhelmed at the end of the day, many, many days. That's the bad news. But the good news is, is that it doesn't have to stay this way. And I'm going to give you tangible, actionable, bite-sized steps that can transform your life at work and at home. And by the end of this episode, you are going to be equipped with seven strategies, seven habits that can change all of this. Today, you are going to learn the seven habits of highly effective private school leaders. So seven is a lot. I'm going to teach you seven habits, but I promise you that if you adopt just one of these habits, it will change your life for the better at school and at home. I've been a private school leader for 30 years. I don't want you to make the same mistakes as I did that affected me physically and mentally and affected my relationships with my family. I discovered these habits and they changed my life and I want them to change your life. I'm going to take each of the seven habits, teach you the habit, and then apply it to your role as a private school leader. One more thing before we get started. We're going to be talking about seven habits today, but that's a lot to cover in a podcast and it's probably too much to remember, but I've got you covered. All you have to do is listen and just take it all in, and I've got a cheat sheet for you linked in the show notes, and you can find that at theprivateschoolleader.com slash episode three. You don't have to write all this down or just try to remember it all. You can just listen and then check out the cheat sheet with everything you need to know. So let's get started. The seven habits of highly effective people is the international best-selling book written by Stephen Covey. And you've probably heard of this great book. It has sold 25 million copies in 40 languages. And if you haven't read the book, that's okay. I'm going to give you the seven habits from this great book and apply them to your life and your role as a private school leader. Now, if you want to read the book, I've linked it in the show notes below. Okay. Let's learn together the seven habits of highly effective private school leaders. Habit number one, be proactive. So there are two kinds of people in the world, reactive people and proactive people. Reactive people focus on the things that they can't control. They complain about the weather. It's either too hot or too cold. They complain about the traffic. They complain about the cashier at Walmart. They complain about the price of everything. Do you know anybody like this? I guess you probably do. Life happens to them. They think they can't do anything about it, and so they complain. Proactive people, on the other hand, they focus on what they can control, and they take responsibility for the way that they react to their environment and to their situation. Proactive people try to respond positively to the situation and try to make it better. So here's the big key. Every day, you choose whether you are a proactive person or a reactive person. So hold up a second. Let's, I want to hit you with that again. Every day, you choose whether you are a proactive leader or a reactive leader at your private school. And I want to tell you about Viktor Frankl. 
Victor was a Holocaust survivor and a psychologist and an author, and he was taken to the notorious Auschwitz concentration camp where his wife, mother, father, and brother were all killed. Victor Frankl somehow survived and went on to write Man's Search for Meaning, a book about how he survived, and many consider it to be one of the greatest books of the 20th century, Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, Victor Frankl said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Victor Frankl had almost everything taken away from him by the Nazis. The thing that they couldn't take away from him was his ability to choose the way that he responded to his circumstances. To be a proactive person, I have to choose my response to every situation. Okay, let's apply that to your role as a private school leader. And let's do that by talking about reactive language versus proactive language. So reactive language would be something like, that parent makes me so angry. But proactive language would be, I control my own feelings. Reactive language would be, I don't have the time to do this. Whereas proactive language would be, this is a priority to me, and I will find the time to do this. And reactive language would be, that's just the type of leader that I am. And proactive language would be, I can try a different approach. So we can evaluate the things that we say and decide whether we're using reactive language or proactive language. Reactive people complain. And complaining gives a person permission to put forth less effort. That's not you. You're better than that. Do you want to be a better leader, a better parent, a better partner, a better spouse? You can start by accepting responsibility for the way that you react to every situation. Be intentional about reacting in a way that will make the situation better. I used to complain a lot and blame other people when things weren't going well at my school. Blame the board, blame the teachers, complain about the parents. And that didn't do any good. But my life changed as a private school leader when I started to take responsibility for my reaction to every stimulus. I became a much better leader when I stopped using reactive complaining thinking and started to use proactive thinking. Remember what Viktor Frankl said about how he survived the Holocaust. He said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So as private school leaders, we have to decide what are we going to do in that space between stimulus and response, and we need to choose to be proactive and not reactive. Habit number one is be proactive. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Okay, I want you to use your imagination. I want you to pretend that you are attending a funeral. There are flowers and people are speaking in hushed tones and there's a casket at the front of the big room at the funeral home. Now imagine that you walk up to the casket and you look down and you see something absolutely shocking. You see that it is actually you in the casket and that this is your funeral. So remember, you're using your imagination. You back away from the casket. You keep backing away until you're in a corner far away from the casket. You look around and everyone starts to sit down and someone walks up to the podium and everyone in the funeral home gets really, really quiet and all eyes are fixed on the person at the podium. And then the person starts talking about you. Now, I want you to think really hard about this next question. What do they say about you? Do they say he was a great husband, father, brother, friend, uncle? Do they say that she was a great wife, mother, sister, friend, aunt? Maybe they say that you were an amazing leader and in your long career as a private school leader, they talk about the hundreds or even thousands of lives that you changed, 
the lives of children. They say the thing that we all aspire to have said about us at our funeral. They say that you made a difference. All right, I know that might have been uncomfortable for you, but it is probably one of the most important things that you can ever think about because habit number two is begin with the end in mind. When you're about to drive somewhere that you've never been before, what is the first thing that you do? Well, of course, you know what the answer is. You pull out your phone, you bring up Apple Maps or Google Maps, you look at your phone or the nav system on the dashboard of your car, and there's one very important piece of information that you have to enter. The word destination is there, and you have to enter your destination. You have to know where you're going. You begin with the end in mind, and then you work backwards every time that you use Apple Maps or GPS, but in our day-to-day lives as private school leaders, we often don't follow this same practice. Now, don't get me wrong. Our schools have strategic plans and mission statements and accreditation guidelines, and those provide us a sense of where we are going as a school. But where are you going as a leader? Where are you going as a spouse or a partner or a parent or a friend? Very specifically, where are you going And what is the destination? Let's go back to that funeral home for a minute. When they are giving your eulogy, they are going to say nice things. But people always say nice things at funerals. What if they had to tell the honest truth? Truth serum is administered to the person giving the eulogy. What do they say about you as a person and as a leader? I can't answer that question for you, but I can answer it for me. And I want to be brutally honest with you. Over my 30 years as a private school leader, it's really only been the last nine or 10 years that I honestly think that I would be happy about what they would say about me at my funeral. During the first 20 years of my career, someone that was speaking honestly would have said, a nice guy, worked hard, tried to be a good dad and a good husband, but he just worked all the time, was stressed out all the time, seemed to be overwhelmed all the time. He worked really hard at the school, but to be honest, he didn't really seem all that happy and he didn't really have all that much time for his family. Is that your story right now? Do you feel stuck? Do you feel overwhelmed? The first step is to get crystal clear about your destination and then just write it down. How do you want to be remembered? What will your legacy be? Take some time to think about that and write it down. What do you do with that once you've written it down? Well, we'll get to that eventually, but the first step is to figure out what the destination is and write it down. So please just ask yourself this question, how do I want to be remembered? And then write down the answer. Habit number two is begin with the end in mind. Okay, so we're learning the seven habits of highly effective private school leaders. Habit number one is be proactive. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. And habit number three, put first things first. I want to tell you a story. On the first day of class in the fall semester, a college professor had a classroom full of freshmen. To start the class, he set a large glass jar on the table in front of the room. And he took six large rocks and put them in the glass jar. And the top rock was very close to the top of the jar. He looked to the class and said, by a show of hands, how many of you think that this jar is full? And a few hands went up. The professor then took a bucket of small pebbles about the size of marbles, and he poured them in all around the rocks and shook the jar and kind of pounded it down so that they would all settle. And then he looks to the class as the small pebbles come to the top of the jar, and he says to the class, is it full now? And more hands go up. And the professor says nothing, but he reaches underneath the cabinet and takes out a bucket of sand and he pours it in and shakes and pounds and turns and makes this all fit in around the small pebbles until the sand is even with the top of the jar. And he looks at the class and says, is the jar full now? And almost every hand goes up. But then the professor takes a pitcher of water and he pours it in. It absorbs into the sand, 
and he pours until the water starts to run over a little bit at the top of the jar, and he turns to the class and he says, now it's full. But then he asks the question to the students, what's the lesson that I just taught you? And so hands go up and one freshman said, if we work really hard and jam our schedules full of all of our academics and sports and activities, we can get it all done and we can have a great year. And he said, no, the lesson is that you need to put the big rocks in first. Now, I'm sure that you've probably heard that story before. I'm sure that you know that you have to put the big rocks in first because if the sand and the marbles and the water and everything else were in there first, that there's no way that you're going to fit in those big rocks. But that's what we do every single day as private school leaders. So let's pause for a minute. What are the big rocks? So for me, maybe it's family and physical health and mental health and professional growth and important big things at work. But what about for you? You say, well, I know about the big rocks, and I would, I would put the big rocks in first, but almost nobody does this. Well, why is that? Why is that true, especially, especially true for private school leaders? I believe it's because we mistake urgent for important. And so we work on what is latest and loudest and not on what we should really be doing. We work on what's latest and loudest and not what's really important. So let's, let, me, let me just ask you a question. Is that you? Now, now, don't get me wrong. I know that we have one of the most unpredictable jobs in the world. A student shoves a student at recess. A parent is upset and they call. A board member or a big donor needs you. And that can derail the most perfectly planned day. I get that. That happens to me all the time. Heavyweight champ Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So I know what it's like to start the day with a really great plan and a lot of energy and a desire to be really productive. And then all that goes out the window before 7.30 a.m. And it's frustrating. So if habit number three is put first things first, how does a private school leader actually do that? Well, I'll tell you what's worked best for me. I stopped prioritizing things in my day and I started to schedule my priorities. Okay, hold up. I really want you to catch this. So I will say that again. I stopped prioritizing things in my day and I started to schedule my priorities. And here's how it works. You identify your big rocks that are not related to school, family, fitness, mental health, finances, for example. And then you schedule those into your master schedule or your Google calendar, and you create an actual appointment with yourself that says, for example, time with the kids, 7 to 8 p.m., or mindfulness, 5.30 to 5.35 a.m., or exercise, 5.45 to 6 a.m. And then you treat that like it's a doctor's appointment that took six months for you to get. You know, one of those appointments that it's so hard to get that you would never even think of canceling it. So now you've got the non-school related big rocks scheduled into your Google Calendar, into your weekly schedule. Now you need to schedule your big rocks at work in exactly the same way. And I'm not talking about your recurring meetings like board meetings, faculty meetings, strategic planning meetings. I'm talking about the things that are important but not urgent. So be sure to catch this. As private school leaders, we are always mistaking things that are urgent but not important for things that are important and not urgent. One more time, super important for you to hear this. As private school leaders, we are always mistaking things that are urgent but not important for things that are important and not urgent. So what is important to you at your job that you never seem to be able to get time to do? Well, only you can answer that question. Maybe it's more teacher observations, more coaching up of newer teachers, more intentional, proactive communication. Maybe it's programming to increase student retention. You have to decide what those big rocks are. You have to decide what's important but not urgent. 
and then schedule that into your calendar. And then here's where the self-discipline comes in. You have to treat it like it's a doctor's appointment that took you six months to get. Do you want to know why you feel discouraged at work or at the end of a day you feel overwhelmed or you feel like you haven't accomplished anything? It's because you spent the entire day working on other people's priorities. In a future podcast, I'm going to teach you how to get your inbox under control, but I want you to think about this statement. Your email inbox is a chronological list of other people's priorities. Let me say that one more time. Your email inbox is a chronological list of other people's priorities. And some of us are slaves to our inbox and we treat emails like they are important when really they are urgent. And I know we have to get to all of that. And it seems like this is a little bit of a fairy tale that we can actually make this work. But I want you to hear this. Real fulfillment at work comes from being able to work on important things that really matter, even if it's only every once in a while or for a little bit of time each day. Let me throw you a quick bonus hack that can help you accomplish this. I told you to schedule the important things into your day, but I also said that you know that our days are very unpredictable. So in order to succeed with this strategy, you need to schedule near the end of your day before you leave for the day, what I call contingency time. And it's like the safety net, it's like a catch-all. And if you have something that's important, but not urgent that you want to get to, and then something derails that, you bump it to that contingency time. And I can tell you from experience, it feels especially good when you actually still get to that important thing, even if it's only for 20 minutes, and especially when it's a little bit towards the end of the day. So the third habit is put first things first. And that means that you have to decide what are your big rocks, and then schedule them into your calendar, and then treat them like non-negotiable appointments. Okay, the seven habits of highly successful private school leaders. Habit number one, be proactive. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Habit number three, put first things first. And habit number four is think win-win. You may have noticed that these first three habits are about improving yourself. Well, the next three habits take the challenge up another level because they involve improving our interactions with others. I just want to pause here for a second and remind you, you don't have to master all seven of these habits to be a better leader. We're just going to try and focus on just one habit, but it's important to hear what these habits are so that you can identify which of these seven habits do you want to start with to try to improve in that area. And also remember that I have a cheat sheet for you in the show notes so that you will be more able to apply what you've learned without trying to remember everything. Okay, so habit number four, think win-win. This one is pretty straightforward. You know what it means when it's a win-win situation. The outcome is mutually beneficial to all parties. But how do we get to win-win more often as private school leaders, especially when there are so many moving parts, like teachers deferring to your authority or you deferring to the board's authority or a parent pushing you for something that's not in the best interest of the child and so on. It's a challenge, but here's how we get there. First, number one, I have to display humility because ego, my ego is the enemy to a true win-win. Number two, I have to remember that life is an interdependent reality and not an independent reality. You may think that you have to be a rugged individualist to be a successful private school leader, but you're wrong, and that kind of thinking is what will help end, have you end up in the hospital or just out of education altogether. It is not an independent reality. It's an interdependent reality. Third, you just need to maintain a long-term big-picture perspective. Don't do something in the short term that ruins a relationship in the long term. Maybe giving in a little at the beginning can help put down strong roots for a long-term win-win relationship with a parent or a teacher or a board member. Number four, be assertive, which means avoiding the extremes of being too aggressive or too passive. 
Sometimes I'm a little too passive, a little too nice, and I need to be a little more assertive. So remember that assertive means avoiding the extremes of being too aggressive or being too passive. And then the fifth way to land on win-win is to use heavy doses of consideration and courage. And in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey says, maturity is the balance between courage and consideration. Okay, habit number one, be proactive. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Habit number three, put first things first. Habit number four, think win-win. And that brings us to habit number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. It was a Wednesday morning in early April. I remember that I was not looking forward to the meeting. I knew I had at 1 p.m. a meeting with Mrs. Bronson, the mother of one of my eighth grade students. I knew she would walk into my office and I knew that she wasn't happy. She wasn't happy about Karen's grades. She wasn't happy about Karen's teachers. She wasn't happy with the amount of homework that Karen was taking home each night and she really wasn't happy with me. Mrs. Bronson knocked on my door at exactly 1 p.m. And she had a yellow legal pad with handwritten notes. And I thought, here we go. And she started right in with everything that I expected. She was angry. She was frustrated. She was emotional. But I remember thinking that I just really needed to try to listen past those emotions and just try to hear what was really going on. And so I just let her go. I used all those active listening skills, the body language and jotted down a few notes and I I didn't interrupt and I just listened and it was 23 minutes of listening to Mrs. Bronson before she ran out of steam but something happened while I was listening I realized that the problems that she was describing weren't the actual problem what I heard behind her words I heard fear fear because Karen's anxiety at home had reached an all-time high and her eating habits had changed and Mrs. Brunson didn't come right out and say it, but I knew that she and her husband were afraid that Karen was going to end up in the hospital or worse before the last day of school. And here we were, spring of the eighth grade year. I told Mrs. Bronson that I had heard, and I told her what I thought I had heard, and I just tried to show some empathy and compassion and told her that I would meet with Karen's teachers and come up with a plan and help Karen get through to the last day of school. And I told her that Karen's emotional and physical safety were more important to us, the team, her teachers and me, that her grades and her body of work throughout all of middle school had already secured her preferred high school placement. And I just told Mrs. Bronson that we would take care of Karen and that everything was going to be okay. And she started to walk out of the office And she turned around as she had the doorknob in her hand. And she looked at me and she said, thank you for hearing me. And then she walked out the door. And thankfully the plan worked. And Karen had a less stressed and less anxious finish to her school year. And she went on to rocket during her freshman year of high school. And I wish I could say that I always listened like that. I can't say that. I've blown it many, many times. Sometimes I'm not really listening. I just look like I'm listening, but I really am just thinking about what I'm going to say next and how I'm going to defend my teachers or our grading scale or just defend myself. And I really want you to catch this. Hold up for a second and just tune in and just really, really listen to this next sentence. We need to listen for the real problem that is usually behind the first problem. The real problem is usually behind the first problem. And I believe strongly that we have a listening crisis in our country. We have so many distractions between our smartphones and Netflix and iTunes and electronic billboards and pop-up ads that I think it's never been more difficult to really, really listen. But it's also never been more important for leaders to listen, to listen to teachers listen to students, listen to parents. And I always say at my school, I say, everyone has stuff, it's just different stuff. 
And if private school leaders are going to help our students and teachers and parents with their stuff, we have to seek first to understand and then to be understood. And George Bernard Shaw has a great quote. He said, the biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. He's right. We have to set aside agendas and ego and temper and the need to be right and just stop and try to be totally present and listen with every fiber of our being. Is it difficult? Of course it is. It's probably one of the most difficult and yet most important responsibilities that we have as leaders, but I actually think it's more than a responsibility. I think it is our duty to listen. And I cannot possibly overemphasize how important it is to seek first to understand and then to be understood. Okay, we're almost there. Habit number one, be proactive. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Habit number three, put first things first. Habit number four, think win-win. Habit number five, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And habit number six is synergize. I'm a pretty big sports fan, and I think one of the greatest moments in sports history is the miracle on ice that happened at the 1980 Winter Olympics. The U.S. men's hockey team defeated a far superior Russian team that was undefeated. And I know I'm dating myself, but most major upsets in sports or politics or on the battlefield were because a group was far greater than the sum of its parts. And that was certainly true with the hockey team, the men's hockey team at the 1980 Winter Olympics, the Miracle on Ice. Synergy has become kind of an eye-roll-inducing corporate buzzword over the years, but that doesn't mean that it's not a real thing. We all know that we can accomplish more together than we can on our own, and that's why the sixth habit, Synergize, is so important. That said, there's a big difference between a group of people and a group of people that have synergy. And we know with teams that almost always in life, one plus one equals two, but we've also seen with teams that sometimes one plus one equals seven. You can probably remember at your school a time when your team, whether it was your group of teachers or the um, entire uh, faculty, that they rose to the occasion and that they did, did something that just really the result exceeded your expectations. So we could talk about teams and teamwork. That could be a whole separate podcast, and it probably will be. But I just want you to focus on just really one aspect of high-performing teams. And then we'll move on to the final habit, habit number seven. Okay, in 2013, the Harvard Business Review published research where they studied 60 teams within a large information processing company And in that study, the highest performing groups averaged six positive comments for every one negative comment, and the lowest performing groups averaged just one positive comment for every three negative comments. So the way that the people interacted with each other, the highest performing teams, six positive for every one negative comment, and the lowest performing teams, one positive comment for every three negative comments. So if we want to have synergy on our teams, first, we need to treat others with respect. Second, we need to emphasize positivity in the ways that our teams communicate with each other, and we need to model that. And the old saying is that we can disagree without being disagreeable, and that's something that we can aspire to do with our teams. And I'm not saying that we all need to hold hands and sing campfire songs. Disagreements are healthy but we need to model respectful communication. And we also need to encourage our teams to stay curious a little longer. I think that that's really important because everyone has an idea and usually thinks that their idea is the best, but we just need to listen a little more than we talk and stay curious a little longer. Our schools need strong teams. Our kids deserve the results that can come from strong teams. And as leaders, it's our responsibility to guide them to achieve synergy. So one more time, I want to just hit you with that, that our kids deserve the results that come from strong teams. And as private school leaders, we need to set that example. 
All right, we're almost there. Habit number one, be proactive. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Habit number three, put first things first. Habit number four, think win-win. Habit number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Habit number six, synergize. And that brings us to our final habit, habit number seven, sharpen the saw. A man was walking through the woods one day when he came upon a lumberjack who was cutting down trees with a handsaw. The lumberjack was clearly frustrated and was cursing at his saw. The man asked the lumberjack, why are you so frustrated? To which the lumberjack replied, my saw blade is dull because I've been cutting down trees all day. The man trying to be helpful said, well, why don't you just stop and sharpen your saw? And the lumberjack replied, I'm too busy to sharpen my saw. And you've probably heard that story before. And I wonder if you've heard this quote from Abraham Lincoln. He said, if you give me six hours to cut down a tree, I will spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. You know the story. You may know the quote. You know that you should take time out of your busy schedule to sharpen your saw and practice some self-care, but you are just too busy. The most valuable asset in your life is you. The most valuable asset in your life is you. You can get another car. You can get a different house. You could get a different job or work at a different school, but there's only one you. And I'll be the first to admit that for 20 years, I actually did a pretty lousy job with this for the first 20 years of my career. But after ulcers put me in the hospital about 10 years ago, I knew that I had to make some major changes in this area, and I did. When you are in an airplane and the flight attendants go through the pre-flight safety procedures, they always tell you what to do if the cabin loses pressure. Oxygen masks will drop down in front of your face, but they say something very important. If you're sitting next to a child or an elderly person, you need to put on your own oxygen mask first before helping the person next to you with their mask. One of the biggest problems in private school education today is that the leaders of our schools are running themselves into the ground, working 80 hours a week, working harder, experiencing more stress than ever before. And what is the result of that? Okay, get ready for some alarming statistics. Every year in America, 12% of school principals leave the profession. 20% of private school leaders leave their schools every year and 50% leave every three years. Of course, there are a lot of contributing factors for those decisions, but that said, I feel strongly that a lack of self-care is near or at the top of that list. If you want to have a long and happy career as a private school leader, you have to get serious about sharpening your saw. I want you to thrive and not just survive as a private school leader, but how? How could you possibly do this with all the things that you have to do? You just don't have time to sharpen your saw. Well, let me give you two ideas. First, make sure that self-care is one of your big rocks and schedule it into your calendar, just like we talked about in habit number three, put first things first. And second is start small. If you try to go from not sharpening your saw at all to doing a bunch of things, you'll fail. Just pick one of these four areas, physical, social, mental, or spiritual. Pick one area, pick one thing that you're going to do for 10 minutes a day, and do that for four weeks, and then pick something to add to it. Just 10 minutes a day, and then just try to stick with that for four weeks, just one thing. And you'll be amazed at the difference that just 10 to 20 minutes a day can make in your life. And if you say that I don't have 10 to 20 minutes in my day to sharpen my saw, then you are also saying that self-care is not one of your big rocks. And you're also setting yourself up for mental health or physical health issues. For your sake and for the sake of your loved ones and your students and your teachers, I'm literally begging you to make this a priority. So please start small and be intentional with sharpening your saw. Okay, we made it. The seven habits. 
And before we do a quick review of the seven habits of highly effective private school leaders, I want to ask you if you think that your teachers would benefit from hearing about these habits in a way that is directly tailored to them. I've created a 50-minute webinar that you can use as a plug-and-play PD, and it's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Private School Teachers. You can use this free webinar on a professional development day or at a faculty meeting, and I've created a sheet of guided notes to go with it so that they could learn what you've just learned. And all that's available in the show notes and go to privateschoolleader.com slash episode three. And all of that is there for you. So again, a plug and play PD for your teachers can be found over at the privateschoolleader.com slash episode three. Okay, let's wrap this up. Do a quick review. Habit number one, be proactive. Remember that you have the power to choose how you react to every situation. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Think about what you want people to say about you at your funeral. Also remember that the first thing that you do when going on a trip is enter the destination into your GPS. Habit number three, put first things first. You must decide on your big rocks and put them in first. Habit number four, think win-win. Use courage and consideration so that all parties can benefit from your interactions with them. Habit number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Listen for the real problem that is usually behind the first problem. Habit number six, synergize. We can always accomplish more together than we can by ourselves. And habit number seven, sharpen the saw. Your most important asset is you. I hope that you got value from this episode, and I just wanted to remind you that the Private School Leader Podcast exists to help you thrive and not just survive at one of the most difficult jobs in the world. And from one private school leader to another, I know that you have very specific issues that you face at your school. My goal is to take my 30 years of experience and try to be very practical with this podcast so that you can learn how to grow as a leader, but also to get some real tools and strategies that you can use right away. Now, I know this episode was a little longer than usual, and I mentioned about the cheat sheet in the show notes and also the free 50-minute webinar for your teachers, the seven habits of highly effective private school teachers that you could use as a plug-and-play PD, and all that is there for you at theprivateschoolleader.com slash episode three. A new episode of the Private School Leader Podcast comes out every week. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by looking for at the Private School Leader. And if you got value from this episode, again, please subscribe to this podcast, but also share it with one other leader or aspiring leader that you know that might get some value as well. I've been your host, Mark Minkus. I really appreciate you and the amazing job that you are doing to make a difference in the lives of these lucky kids. Thank you so much for taking some of your precious time to join me here today. And I'll see you next time on the Private School Leader Podcast. And until then, always remember to serve first, lead second, and make a difference.